I do believe, like you, that this conversation needs to happen, in particular in, in places that are uh, being colonized by the European diaspora. I do think it's highly necessary to, to heal that trauma. I think healing is a key word in what you said. But at the same time, I think that uh, keeping some kind of, uh, of mental shackles, you know, and, 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 and keeping being reduced to this idea, to me, is, is maybe stands in the way of moving forward, maybe. Okay. Welcome to Who's Curating Who. My name is Rogaya Sek. I'm a program maker at Sabali, and I organize this event together with my colleague Jelle Baars and the Cobra Museum of Modern Art, uh, and as part of the Black Achievement Month. In response to the exhibition Cosmogonies in the Cobra Mu Museum, we would like to talk about contemporary art from the African continent and the representation of it here in Europe. The exhibition Cosmogonies is a selection of the collection of the Sinsu Foundation of the Beninese French Sinsu family, including pieces from Samuel Faso, Ibrahim Mahama, and Sanele Muholi. Home to over a thousand works, this collection is regularly presented uh, at the Museum Sinsu in Ueda in Benin. Uh, I want to start this, ev uh, this evening, this afternoon, uh, by inviting the founder and president of the Sinsu Foundation. Um, she's an art historian uh, who comes from a family of Beninese politicians and intellectuals. A warm welcome to Marie-Cécile Sinsu. The foundation was uh, founded in 2005. Yeah. Uh, can you take us back? How did it start? It started with, uh, with a visit in Dusseldorf. Uh, in Dusseldorf, there was an exhibition in 2003 or 2004 called Africa Remix, um, where uh, many artists from the continent were presented. And going back to Benin, there was a feeling that it was weird to have to go to Germany to see contemporary creation from the continent mm -hmm. and not be able to see it anywhere around uh, our countries. Mm -hmm. And from north to south, it was, there, was, there were no spaces and, and so it started with this idea that we had a young generation uh, that had to build itself and reinvent itself uh, because we are countries uh, in the Western African region who have been independent since uh, 1960. Mostly. Benin? Yeah, Benin, but... All all the countries around uh, mostly have been independent since 1960. So we are very new countries, being very old countries and very new countries. And with a very specific history, with um, uh, having our history erased by colonization uh, during mm -hmm. um, 60, 80 years, 100 years, depending on the countries. And so we have here in 2005, a young generation that need to build itself to create its future. And mm -hmm. the question is, who are we? And one of the answer was, um, let's create a space for artists to help us build this idea of who we are. And how did you, um, because we are watching, we can see um, photos of uh, the museum in Ueda. Did it start with the museum? Or was there something before the museum? Did it start with art? No, it didn't start with the museum. It started with an empty space that was 800 square meters. And the idea was like, Okay, we've seen Africa Remix, it's really big, it's like on 3,000 square meters. How do we find a big space to show uh, great exhibitions? And so it started, weirdly enough, it started with a the space, then we found some money, then we found uh, Romuald Azoumé who wanted to mm -hmm. exhibit in his country because I had seen his work in lots of institutions uh, around the world. And I wanted to be able to show him to the people around in Benin because mm -hmm. no, mostly no one had seen his work once in the French Institute, which was the only exhibition space uh, at the time. Um, so it started like this because I was 21. I didn't come from a family uh, of curators or museum directors. Or, so I came from a family with uh, professors, doctors, bankers, so people who had not really an idea of how do we build museums. So first it was an exhibition space, and then um, a few years later it became a museum. I want to quote you. Uh, people outside Africa have absolutely, absolutely no idea about Africa. I can now observe a real movement on this continent. I rarely talk about Africa, preferring to talk specifically about the countries, countries and cities. 
But there's something happening on this continent from north to south and from east to west, which we are trying to express in this collection. You want me to explain that? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's, that it's a feeling I have when I'm in Europe um, that people don't know uh, the African continent. Mm -hmm. They live on a very 19th century image uh, and uh, that is... Thanks. When you are when you have history lesson, I wouldn't speak about the Netherlands because I'm not sure of the history programs and everything. But in France, uh, you tend to learn Africa while um, uh, drawing geography maps, and then after you learn about slavery quickly, about colonization quite quickly because it comes at the end of the year, and usually you have other things to see uh, before uh, the exams. So actually, you have a very 19th century uh, idea of the African continent, and you don't realize um, uh, that. It probably is today one of the center, uh, important centers of the world. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm in Europe, I'm often uh, facing uh, questions and views that are totally from another century that doesn't, uh, that doesn't uh, match my generation. And Can you the give an example of that? Um, it, it's difficult because it's not going to be... Uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to give example without uh, speaking about racist <laughs> um, comments or things like that, which are often very nice, you know, like friendly racism. Like we have a lot uh, when we present uh, the exhibition and people are, are friendly asking questions that is like, you're not savages, you're not like this, you're not, are you know, really, you, you're quite modern. Is that and really we something you, you hear it's, nowadays? It's things you hear nowadays, yeah. It's, uh, it's things savages. we're confronted to. And, no, but you know what I mean? It's like... People ask you questions that are not in phase with, with what we are living. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's why the collection, it's not, the, we didn't curate the exhibition, um, but we had to face some question during the creation of the exhibition where we were a bit, um, I don't know how to say, but blown away. Yeah, sometimes a bit blown away by the things that would be written or, um, or for example, uh, we spoke about it when we visited the exhibition together. Um, the first uh, room is about, um, where Emo's uh, works are shown, is about um, alphabets and codes. And the first um, explanation on the wall was saying Africa as an oral tradition, but they made symbols to understand each other. And I was like, okay, so <laughs> what do you mean by Africa only has oral tradition? But it was like, you know, in Africa, in people the... speak under the tree and they exchange, but mm -hmm. they never write. Like, excuse me, but the University of Timbuktu in the 14th century is the most important university in the world. Uh, we didn't keep all the manuscript, but there are still like one million kept today. So what do you mean by we are talking, 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 and then our history is flying away? It's an idea that the colonization decided to impose in the 19th century because we had they had to find justification mm -hmm. to come to Africa and bring some uh, bring their lights to us, but it's not true. And typically, this is something we had to face those questions like Africa is like this, and then um, so that's how we chose the words. And I was like, no, it's very interesting to understand that we have very different codes, but we also have very different different alphabets and we have mm -hmm. very different right, right, written stories because today we are 54 countries but we used to be thousand kingdoms mm -hmm. so we have all our traditions maybe some of the some kingdoms didn't write I, I didn't check at the you know at the mm -hmm. bottom of some are, some are oral the, some, some are written yeah but I mean you can't uh, define us uh, as having an oral tradition and having our histories that flew away. It's very important. So that's the kind of things, you know, that, that are nice from the people who, who want to explain us or want, want to explain the collection. And they will tell you nicely that, you know, you have oral tradition, but we invented plenty of symbol, which is a very good news. So that's very nicely done, but actually it's just, you know, what I call friendly racism. It's, is there uh, something you recognize? Uh, yes, I mean, it, it, this is authentic. Like uh, three days ago, my older daughter, so uh, I, you have to excuse her, she's not an, even six, but she said, uh, Daddy, when you, were, uh, when you were little, when you were living in Benin, um, did you live in like real houses or you did, did you have houses with thatches, etc.? So uh, the way she's cooled, uh, I mean, the perception she has of Africa, she's, she grew up in Paris. I mean, she's been, of course, to Cotonou uh, is this. But, but uh, what Marissa said, said about the old tradition is kind of interesting to me because the thing is uh, there was um, 
I mean, the, the classical history of philosophy in Europe, you know, they have this uh, Socrates as being the first sort of a seminal philosopher. And one, one thing that's pretty important about Socrates is that he didn't want to write anything. So his student, Plato, uh, decided to write what the first philosophical writer that's considered as the greatest philosopher, etc., etc. But uh, I think this attitude of Socrates was about what is lost in writing. So it's not about, not only there is in Africa, I mean, obviously, like in the Adinkra alphabet was, I mean, invented like in the 19th mm -hmm. century, so there were a lot of alphabets. I mean, and if, and, and that's if you don't take into consideration, you know, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, etc. But the idea that, of course, there are written languages, and of course there is, but the fact is, orality shouldn't be seen as, uh, I could say, a previous stage Mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 something that's inherently different and that transfers and transmits other things and that's why for instance some uh, occult traditions are only communicated orally not only because they need to be kept secret mm -hmm. but also because what is happening with the human word and the vibration or whatever you I mean the the, the actual the physical phenomenon of, of speech is different and it's and it's and to some extent it's less convenient to you know uh, to I don't know, remember meetings, but it's, uh, it's more useful to communicate things that are at the, at, at the frontier of something that is, you know, emotional intuition. It's, it's, it's just um, something is happening in human speech. I mean, it would be, I mean, sizably different if we were not speaking today, if we're just texting what we're saying right now. <laughs> uh, you would, yeah. You'd agree. I want to invite Arthur Kibbelaar on stage. Uh, he's a diplomat of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. Uh, throughout his career, he worked as a diplomat in Madrid, Belgrad, and Bujumbura. And I think I am way more, I think. Uh, alongside his career, he has been involved in various art foundations. He's committed to collecting art and culture in the broadest sense uh, to foster cultural diplomacy. And we spoke each other uh, this week at um, the exhibition, at the opening of the exhibition. And you said this, uh, we have to take this um, conversation further um, and that it was important to not, re that it shouldn't be a, a superficial um, conversation. Um, when are you satisfied today? Never. <laughs> That's difficult. I don't think it's about satisfaction. It's mm -hmm. more about enhancing the conversation. Um, but maybe because you just presented me as a diplomat, I do think that without art and culture, we cannot interpret any society well. Mm -hmm. So for me, it has been very instrumental to always engage in the art conversation, cultural conversations, and the... I think artists usually tell me more about the country than any political analysis or anything else. And I think that is left out in much of the conversation when we try to understand Africa. Um, usually, from my professional perspective, mm -hmm. we try to read a document, we write to see the figures, economic statistics, but we do not understand the interpretation of the main artists, mm -hmm. who I think usually have a language that is far more compelling than what we do. So that's why I think we need to, and it's everywhere, it's not only between Africa and Europe, I think the complexity of culture is always difficult to grasp, even in the Netherlands, but particularly in Africa, because we have so many stereotypes, because we have, uh, I think, not dealt with our past, and because the education is totally insufficient. Here in the Netherlands. Yes, and in more. I think even in Africa, my experience, I'll be very honest with you, in Africa itself was that there was also a dilemma about what Africa represented or what, in my case, Mali or Burundi uh, represented to itself. So the artist... Uh, what did you notice about that dilemma? That it wasn't always presented, that there was a lack of presentation of uh, valuable artists mm -hmm. that didn't get always the, the platform. The gap that Marie Cecile yes. uh, is trying to... Yeah, but it's not only in infrastructure, it's not only about museum, it's also in cultural sense, how to value what the artist is saying. I think that is something that was not always recognized, acknowledged, 
I lived in countries where we were emerging from conflict or going through conflict. And I felt that artists sometimes has a much better way of understanding the dynamics in that society. So it's not always about the museums and platforms and galleries, which I think are very important to present it to the public. But I think it's also in daily life. How do we get to know better what is going on in the society you live in? Well, Arthur was also talking about uh, the theme of decolonization. Is that something, a theme that is um, a big topic in the art world on the African continent? Ah, yes, <laughs> on the African they continent. Yeah, no, I, so I thought you were going to ask me about Benin specifically. And, uh, uh-huh. and um, because it's, um, there is one thing... Um, you have a young generation, our public. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the guys who went, who came to the exhibition mm-hmm. from Benin uh, in Amsterdam, which uh, was very surprising for me. And they are uh, so he, this guy and this girl. They were twen- they are twenty five, and they are part of a generation that says, "Okay, we know about slavery. We know about colonization. Mm-hmm. Actually, we know our history, which is quite rare." Mm-hmm. Uh, can you please leave us uh, mm-hmm. be and uh, invent something else? And I think the decolonization problem is maybe mostly a European uh, problem, a um, European problem, and the fact that we we we're a globalized world, so the decolonization comes to us. We have a profound uh, decolonization. Uh, a, a, no, profound colonization problem, but. Some people, um, some, a young generation today knows uh, it, uh, our history and wants to go over it. They know it and they want to address the future. They don't want to address the history. Because we are always brought back to slavery, brought back to colonization. And at one point, some the young people, some of them want to, to invent another story. And knowing that and getting away from that. But it's difficult uh, when we have the relationship in Europe because in one case, we know this history and we want to move on. And in the other case, it's like people don't know their history. So it's like it's... um, L'histoire est niée. I don't know how you would... uh, It's it's denied. Yeah, our history is denied because people don't know about it. Mm -hmm. You see, so we're in this weird point where we have to find... um, Common language? Yeah. If I go back historically, uh, I'll go first with colonization and then with slavery. Uh, colonization is 80 years, okay, on, uh, on the history of a continent that's thousands of years old. So the thing is, um, I, I do understand this idea that, I mean, a lot of structures, even the, in the political aspect are, and, and the daily life, are still in, infused with colonization. I mean, what's interesting in Dakar, I, I was at the Biennale, is exactly what you said. You, are, you have this sort of tourism in Gore, and it's, it's a little bit shocking, but this is about slavery. But regarding colonization, I think it's interesting to look at uh, at it in the perspective of how long it lasted compared to the history of the continent. We are talking about thousands of years on on the one hand and 80 years on the other. So to some extent, you know, as Beninese, I think that focusing exclusively on that is to some point some kind of, it's a little little bit regressive in a way. I do understand the, the, the need to have the conversation to heal the trauma in a way, and also to deconstruct a certain number of things that we build at the same time, at that time. So that's one thing. Regarding colonization, I think it's, it would be interesting. I mean, I'm all in favor of the decolonization movement, but to me, I prefer to have a post-colonial perspective and not a decolonial perspective. And what's the difference between uh, decolonial and post-colonial? Decolonial is trying to sort of stay on this and try to deconstruct, which is a necessary work. But post-colonial is, what is happening now is like Europe and the dominance. Also, we will have an interesting, I have, I have a piece called Chromatics, where I'm sort of uh, deconstructing the idea of black, of the idea of mm-hmm. black and white. And the and I do think that this uh, keeping those words uh, keeps on uh, reinforcing a hegemonic system. So mm-hmm. so it, in a paradoxical way, it, it, it reinforces what it's supposed to fight. But that's another question. But regarding, you know, the, the, the post-colonialists, it's 
Europe is a continent, uh, and there are five continents. Europe has a history. All five continents have a history, meaning this sort of focus on the, you know, on, on, on the, the history of Europe. It's, it's predatory history, which is part of it. Is let's bring it back to what it is. An interesting, important, like group of society, cultural civilization, and so on. But it's not more than that. It's not less, mm. but not more. So it's, I think it's overblowing the importance of Europe today. That's a post-colonial. Do you, you also think that the art that also art from people of color is about uh, their relation uh, with Europe? I, 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 I find it um, non-irrelevant to talk about art from people of color. Yeah. People of color is essentially keeping in place, you know, mm -hmm. the racist category where there's Europeans on one side and all the other on the side. Mm -hmm. So people of color makes no sense for me. You know, the idea is that you have people from different countries, different ethnicities, different cultures. But this idea that we, you would leave in place the very basis of racism, which is white, non-white, which is mm -hmm. European, non-European, and And music as a building, as a stepping stone, mm -hmm. seems almost delirious to me, to be entirely honest. And then to slavery. And what part? Oh, you... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, seriously. How many hours okay. do we have? How many uh, <laughs> You want to, to yeah, make another point? Okay, now okay. to slavery. Now on to slavery. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, we come from Benin. Benin mm -hmm. was a, one of the main providers of slaves, you know, mm -hmm. enslaved people, of deported people, like millions. Nobody knows. I mean, the, the figure today is still debated by historian, but pretty much everyone agrees that from WIDA, probably around a million people were deported. That's the figures I know. What I'm saying is when I hear the story about you know, slavery, this, the, this whole of relationship is kept alive. It's always presented as Europeans, dominant Europeans, coming to Africa and enslaving Africans. And which, with this frame of mind that is Europeans were bad, they were superior, and they were, you know, they were behaving badly. No, this is not true. It was, it was a relation that was completely uh, of, of equal. I mean, you had people were selling, you know, this is a crime against humanity, let's be entirely clear about that, but you were, had people, you had the sellers and you had buyers. And no, I mean, the, the, the buyers were not dominating the sellers. I mean, I had an interesting conversation with someone regarding the French and Portuguese forts in uh, so the Museum of History of Ouida, which is very close to the foundation, what used to be the, the, the Portuguese fort. So it's a place of memory like hundreds, maybe thousands of people died there. They were left in the sun so that the weakest people would die before they would be deported. And uh, there was this idea. So I was talking with the guy, this French guy, and he explained to me, yeah, but that was a fort, so which means that, you know, the Europeans were, the white, sorry, the white guys were dominating the black guys. I said, you know, no, the, the fort was, the garnison was around like a hundred people, and Dahomey Kingdom was like Rome. Every man was a warrior. So you had maybe a hundred thousand people who were, you know, so they were allowed to have a fort. They were not dominating in any way. And the guy, it was terribly difficult for him to understand. And so at the, at the end, I don't like to use black and white. I think it's, it's inherently racist terms. So I said, you are white indeed. It's impossible for you to conceive that Africans and Europeans were on an equal foot at some point in time. I'm finished. <laughs> Arthur? Well, what to say? I, I like the fact that you want to deconstruct the history and the terms of the racial notions of history. But I do think we live in a very racialized world today. And I don't want to indulge too much in the definitions. I consider myself black or a person of color um, in order maybe to point out that we still live in a very racist society. And I think we need that in order to uh, be aware of what the dominance and what the structures still are. Even within the black community, of course, there are still a lot of conversations that we didn't have. So I think, with all respect, that you are already 
uh, way ahead of that discussion. And I like the fact, and this is where I think artists can help us to get out of our obsession of, of, of you know, definitions and color. But we need to deal still in a very racist society in which there's not enough black representation in art world, in uh, whatever system. So in Europe, coming from, a, from for me, a black history um, of diaspora, we need to name it. And if we find a different concept and definition, I'm willing to go along. But as long as we don't have it, the language, I want to point out that there is a structural imbalance and that there is a need to address that. Give me another word, give me another language, and I'm with you. But I am not leaving the main issue here. We are not living in a world that is equal. So it is about equality in the essence. And it's about rethinking the future. And I think for rethinking the future, we need the terminology. And, and mm. that terminology un is not perfect. But Do anyway. you think, Marie, uh, Cecile, do you think... I just want to add something. I had this conversation with a 20-year-old. So she's my uh, niece. So she's, uh, I mean, her father is from Benin and uh, mother from France. And she was explaining to me, so we're having this discussion. And I said, you know, when you're referring to Asian people, are you saying yellow? Would, would, would that be a legitimate term for you? Because to me, using black not only keeps in place, I mean, to me, to, in all the language I, languages I know, African languages I know, the color of my you know, jacket is not the color that he used to qualify African people. So when you say, uh, I mean, uh, for me, using black is uh, in making invisible history and geography. So what's wrong with Africans? I mean, when I see you in the street, if I see you in Cotonou, I will assume you're African. Yeah. And, you know, in, in many places, I mean, if I see you, I, I, I mean, I will, I mean, given the fact that I grew up in an environment where everybody has an African phenotype, the thing is, I don't see you as black. I see you as African, like spontaneously. The, the word that comes to my mind is not black. You could be from pretty much every, any, anywhere in Benin. I mean, you, I mean, that's interesting also with the West Indies and the Caribbean. We need an hour, yeah. an hour more. But okay. I have to say this, <laughs> okay. Rakaia, it's not about the color. It is a political construct. Yeah. That's all I wanted to say. And then, okay, but Marie Cecile, do you think uh, when Arthur is going to Ueda, to your museum, do you think he's going to? Is there a place for the conversation he would like to have, or is it, isn't that a good address for him? I know what I hear is that also we, we talk from very different perspectives. It's um, you talk from the Caribbean, and we talk from Western Africa, and so it's not it's not the same discussion. I and know. it's we and talked about that that yes. we don't have the language, but and we, we have, need to do it. And That's we have why. the question of the diaspora, and I'm not sure you're part of the diaspora, and I'm not part of the diaspora because we are French in France, Benin is in Benin, and so we are never from the French diaspora in Benin or in the Beninese diaspora in France. And so it's very difficult. And this is one of the things we see in WIDA because um, we have a lot of friends from the Caribbean who came to WIDA and they were very shocked, very shocked because uh, um, the street next to the museum is called Chacha de Souza Street. It's the name of a street like anyone. Mm -hmm. It's just that Chacha de Souza is the man who sold the most slave in the 19th century. And, 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 and not even as a, as, as a merchant, it, he, when he did it, slavery was already illegal. So he, he was literally a trafficker of human beings. Yeah, yeah. he was both and he invented uh, new departure ways for <laughs> people when it was, well, so it's, it's the worst person ever, but um, he's a symbol of, um, of some kind of national proudness, if we can say something like that, uh, because if you keep the idea that in the middle of Ouida uh, you have a public space uh, which has its name, that means that people from Ouida sold the slaves and were never taken as slaves, which is still a, a fact of proudness. It's, it's very weird to understand mm -hmm. this mentality. But yeah. So one of the first things I did with um, one of my best friends who 
it's very interesting. He's a, he's a world football champion, so he has like this really big legitimacy in France, in in the rest of the world. And he's coming from uh, Guadeloupe. And the first time he came to Wida, for him it was terrible. He went to the non-return door, um, being practically sure that his ancestors went through that door and did the slave route and went through that door. He comes back and he sees that we are we are celebrating the guy who sold uh, slaves and that, and so. The museum is in uh, in an Afro-Brazilian uh, building. For me, it was very important that we shouldn't put the... Um, Wida is a very colonial uh, city in its architecture. For me, it was very important that we were not in a colonial building, but Afro-Brazilian, it's those um, deported uh, person who came back from Brazil when um, slavery was finished. And they came back with the traditional Brazilian construction uh, methods and uh, architecture. So our museum is this, in this Afro-Brazilian because it's very interesting to think that slavery is not ending with people deported and that's it. No, some people came back. Mm. And the story, this building is important to say that uh, we are not blocked in our history because there is a future always. And having in this heritage building an idea of a vision of the future is very important for me. It's very important that in the middle of the city, I didn't put my museum um, in the economic capital. I put it in this small city uh, next to it because for me, it was important that this city, which is the slavery city, which is the voodoo city, which is a, a city with plenty of history and a humanity history because there is a lot of humanity questions that are solved in WIDA or start in WIDA. So, in this city, I wanted not to be blocked in the history, but have a vision of future. And so that's why I think when you come to see me, which I think you will in, uh, in Wida, um, I think the museum is a good space uh, to have a conversation because you're not blocked in something either way in a vision. You're in an open vision of the uh, of the uh, of our common history. Look, I had two but, points, very oh, okay. short. I short know, points. But I do think this conversation has to take place in Europe much more elaborate mm -hmm. than we mm -hmm. are doing it right now. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it feels like a little bit cramped and I understand we can't mm -hmm. go into it. But that's one. We need to continue this conversation mm -hmm. and I hope that Black Achievement Month or others will organize that in the future more elaborate because we need artists and we need this type of confrontation. Yeah. And the second is, I um, a lot of my DNA actually comes from Benin, so I was really uh, triggered by the fact that we in Curacao, but also I think people living in Europe, have not made those connections as yet. You know, what kind of connections? This type of connection. Okay. Because I think we need to have that personal uh, pilgrimage. To Africa, I had to deconstruct my notion that everyone was talking about slavery and colonialism. And I'm happy that I went to Mali and saw a total other, the thousands of years of impressive history. You mm -hmm. understand? And that helped me in order to, to have this conversation in another way. To, so art is about showing the complexity of that conversation. And that's what I think is important. And, uh, and, and I mean to say that I, I no, but yeah, I mean, I, no, 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 I mean to say that I, I do think I have the, the I mean, the, the greatest respect and, you know, uh, esteem for people who survived the trauma, you know, of deportation and slavery. You know, it's always seen as, but I mean, just to imagine what it was. And, you know, just to mean the amplitude, it lasted for centuries and the conditions of living for people who were oppressed, were killed, I mean, imprisoned every day. So, I mean, I mean to say that what I'm saying and my, you know, my, my way of, of seeing things has nothing to do with, you know, negating that. It's just saying that I do believe, like you, that this conversation needs to happen in particular in, in places that are uh, being colonized by the European diaspora. I mean, either the place of birth of the European diaspora, but Australia, the United States, etc. This is European, these are not white countries. These they, they are countries mm -hmm. colonized by the European diaspora. So I do think it's highly necessary. I do think it's highly necessary to, to heal that trauma. I think healing is a key word in what you said. But at the same time, I think that uh, keeping some kind of uh, of mental shackles you know and, and 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 keeping being reduced to this idea to me is is maybe stands in the way of moving forward maybe okay. 
Uh, on behalf of the time, I'm going to say thank you for the, uh, to be the good. three of you.